So, uh, yeah, so what, shall we shall we start? Yep, yeah, you do the introduction, okay. and uh, I and will get, be get happy to. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the program. Um, our program tonight focuses on the World War One fighter pilot David McKel McKelvey Peterson, and our presenter tonight is Walter Hook, one of Phoenixville Library's very own. And you might have seen him some months ago walking around the library in some um, uh, soldier's uniform, as I recall. Uh, tonight, he is joining us for this particular program that he has a great interest and a personal interest in, and he will tell us about that. Um, my name is Kathy Stout, and I am Mark Pinto's assistant here at the Phoenixville Library and helping to host this program this evening. We're so happy you've joined us. Um, Walter does request that during his presentation, that if you need to make a remark or a question, that you use the chat feature for Zoom um, so that the voice, your voice won't interrupt, but your, but your um, message will come over. Um, and then at the end, he will take any questions on the program um, and his interests. And you can easily unmute yourselves by pressing down the space bar and holding it. Hold it down while you ask your question, and then when you're finished, you may release it. Um, but at the time you're holding it down, he'll be able to tell that one of you uh, does want to ask a question. Um, and also let, letting you know that the program is being recorded this evening, and it will be um, uploaded onto our YouTube site uh, from the library. So thank you for joining us all tonight, and enjoy. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And good evening, I would say. Uh, Guten Abend, Dominic and Heron. Uh, right now I am wearing one of David Peterson's war souvenirs that he had brought back. And it is a pickle haub. It is a German spike helmet. Uh, not very functional as far as providing significant protection, but uh, rather, uh, rather good military display if one were wearing it and marching. So uh, just thought I'd get off the uh, to the, the discussion by uh, doing something a little bit unique in that regard. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, yes, uh, David McKelvey Peterson uh, was a fellow from Honesdale, Pennsylvania. And uh, if you received the outline, that uh, kind of section says, "Why me?" And that "Why me?" Uh, the, is relative to why do I have an interest in David McKelvey Peterson? Well, I'm from Hosea, Pennsylvania, personally, and I grew up in that town. I knew his mother. As a matter of fact, I did some work for his mother. I tended her coal furnace in the wintertime and in the summertime, loading coal into the furnace and taking burnt ashes out of the furnace and discarding them, taking them away so they could be uh, recycled and used wherever old coal ashes were, were dumped in those days. And uh, I also had the pleasure of, when I was doing that as a, as a teenager, working for her and doing odd jobs around the house. And also uh, I had the pleasure of meeting his sister, Charlotte. We'll give you more details on the family as we progress through this presentation. And uh, Charlotte recognized my early interest as a teenager in military history, in World War I aero history, and in the fact that I had some association or knowledge of David McKelvey Peterson. So she gave me a considerable amount of information and uh, piqued my interest further in studying David. So I've been working on this for about 40, 50 years now, and uh, we're getting to the point where maybe we'll have something that could be published eventually. So. Uh, Again, thank you for joining me tonight. And uh, I want to clarify a couple points. If you were to Google Peterson, if you were to check him out on the internet through various sources, whether you go to early aviators, uh, World War One aces, or uh, go just into, into Google and try to find out who David McKelvey Peterson was, you'll find one common misconception. And that was a misspelling of his middle name. His middle name is in fact McKelvey, M-C-K-E-L-V-Y, no E. Uh, 
considerable number, virtually all of the authors who write anything about World War I aviation, who reference David McKelvey Peterson, inadvertently and incorrectly put the E in McKelvey. So that's one of the, um, the common misconceptions. That hopefully, if we take nothing else away from this presentation tonight, we will have clarified why his name was misspelled or why it is misspelled. Uh, back up. David McKelvey Peterson was born in Honesdale, Pennsylvania on July 2nd, 1894. This year would mark his 126th birthday. I'd be uh, quite an elderly gentleman at this point. He attended Honesdale Public Schools and the Presbyterian Sunday School, along with his sister Charlotte, who was considerably younger. She was in the juvenile infant section, and he was in the uh, more uh, grown-up section, as the seven, eight-year-olds would be. He attended Lehigh University, graduated in 1915 with a degree in civil engineering. Uh, another misconception, some authors say that he had a degree in chemical engineering, when well, that's not correct. He was a civil engineer, and uh, as a civil engineer, he worked as his first job for the Dravco Construction Company in Pittsburgh. He stayed there almost a year and then went to Buffalo, New York and worked with Glenn Curtis in the Curtis Airplane Factory, and that's where he learned to fly. His lineage, his father was a physician, Pearson B. Peters, uh, Peterson, an MD. His mother was Louise Jadwin, and she died when uh, David was eight years old or about eight years old. And Louise Jadwin was the sister of um, Brigadier General Ed, Edgar Jadwin. And he was one of the engineers who worked with Gothels in building the Panama Canal. Also, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't a Brigadier General at the time he was working on the Panama Canal, but uh, he uh, was a commissioned officer. He graduated from West Point, and Edgar Jadwin uh, was eventually promoted to Brigadier General, and he was General Pershing's head of all the engineering forces in the American Expeditionary Force in World War I in Europe. Um, after the death of uh, uh, David's mother, his father eventually did remarry, and he had a half-brother named Denton, and Denton died in 1942. But his sister Charlotte uh, lived on to um, a healthy age. In 1916, September of 1916, David sailed to France. And in those days, the noble idea was to assist the French in fighting the Huns. And uh, because of his experience with flying, he thought he would be of significant value to the French. And uh, there is no indication that he went off with that noble idea of being a volunteer ambulance driver and then subsequently migrating through the Foreign Legion into uh, the uh, military or not. Uh, on, on route to France in 1916, he met James Norman Hall. And if any of you find that name familiar, James Norman Hall, along with Nordoff, who was also a escadrille member, um, Nordoff and Hall both uh, collaborated and wrote the Bounty Trilogies and the definitive history of the Lafayette Escadrille. And before I jump too far ahead of myself, I'll give a little more of the history here. Uh, when David arrived in France, he and Paul joined the French Foreign Legion, and um, Paul was an interesting study. He had enlisted in the British Army in 1914, faking that he was a British citizen or that he was a Canadian, and he served as a machine gunner, but was discharged from the British Army when they found out his true nationality. Um, in 1916, en route, when he met Peterson, and Peterson met him, um, he was returning to Europe to write a series of articles for the Atlantic Monthly on the Lafayette Escadrille. And uh, they both enlisted in the French Air Service or the Foreign Legion at the same time. Now, a little bit of history about the Lafayette Escadrille. It was a unit populated eventually by 38 Americans, U.S. citizens, 
who volunteered to fight for France. And they were, it was an Air Corps, and the issues surrounding that were rather complex because Dr. Gross, William Vanderbilt, and uh, quite a few other influential people wanted to have a force of Americans, even though the United States at that time was neutral, wanted to have a force of neutral countrymen fighting for France to give a propaganda prestige or propaganda push to perhaps shifting the uh, emphasis of the United States toward aiding France and uh, entering the war on their side. So that uh, as, it, as it turned out, uh, Dr. Dr. Gross and uh, Prince and uh, a few others, or William Vanderbilt throwing in a significant amount of money, uh, formed what was called the Legion Americaine. And uh, they started flight training for the French, fighter pilot training. But because of the American in the title of the escadrille, the German ambassadors, both in uh, Europe and in uh, the United States, since the United States was a, a neutral country, uh, voiced significant protests against the use of uh, neutral's name being applied to a uh, combat group. So in reference and in uh, 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 acknowledgement of that protest, the name was changed to the Lafayette Escadrille in honor of Lafayette, who had helped George Washington in the Re American Revolution. So that the Lafayette Escadrille then came into formation as a fighter group. And uh, the interesting thing with that is that uh, in the French, um, well, in the French aeronautic, military aeronautic, or aeronautic military, as they would say, the uh, designation of the units were based on the type of planes that they flew. So somewhere during this presentation, you may see something pop up that uh, says that this was, the Lafayette Escadrille was N-124, meaning that the N designation indicated that they were flying Newport planes. And I have, throughout this presentation, various pictures of the types of planes that they flew. And uh, even that is rather remarkable, considering the uh, structure and the uh, basic uh, style of the plane and the uh, limitations of its aeronautical uh, aeronautical capabilities. But anyway, uh, to get back to James Norman Hall, he, he was shot down as a fighter pilot. He was shot down in May of 18 and was taken prisoner. And uh, just to wrap up what I had said before, he wrote many books, including the Mount, Mount, uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, and Botany Bay, Falcons of France, the history of Lafayette Flying Corps, and so forth. And uh, as a matter of fact, in the uh, book, is this is a fictionalized account of flying with the Lafayette Escadrille Falcons of France. One of the characters in the novel is modeled after Peterson. It's a young pilot who's very uh, laid back, very calm, very efficient, and who had lost his mother at an early age. Uh, that alone is kind of the, uh, the trigger right there to indicate, ah, for those of us who have had any knowledge of David's life, a, a trigger to find out that, or indicate that this is the character that uh, he was building his fictional character around. After uh, David joined the French military, Foreign Legion. He was issued a an identification card, and this is just a picture of David with his uh, French Foreign Legion kepi and uh, his identification. And uh, he was sent to pilot training in Avord. And the method that the French used, even though he already knew how to fly, had experience flying, all, all the new pilots were sent to. French training sessions to learn how to fly the French way. And the French training started out by putting the respective aviator 
in a plane, um, a Blero monoplane with a 35 horsepower engine and short wings. It was called, called a penguin. Uh, obviously, it was a penguin because it couldn't fly. And it just gave the uh, prospective candidates a feeling of propeller wash in their face, uh, a feeling of movement on the ground, gave them the ability or led them to develop some type of familiarity with taxiing and propelling the plane in a straight line or a relatively straight line across a, uh, a field because the airfields in those days were not tarmac. They weren't paved. They were basically farmers fields or other fields that had been uh, commandeered to serve as airfields or aerodromes as the uh, terminology was at that time. The next was a roller and it was the same type of monoplane, only a little bit larger wings and a, a little bit stronger engine. Gave the uh, prospective candidate a little bit of uh, feel for what it would be like to actually take off and, and fly. The next was a um, the roller, uh, translates to on sticking or on stuck. And this was a plane that the pilot or the prospective pilot was to taxi, to take off speed, rise about one meter off the ground, and fly in a straight line. And then once the pilot was considered, or the candidate was considered capable of flying, he was put into a plane or one of the other uh, rulers that uh, was capable of flight and had to perform certain maneuvers, such as a tour de piste, uh, flying around the uh, Air, aerodrome at a certain altitude. Uh, then you had to graduate to uh, cross-country flights. And in the cross-country flights, the uh, pilot or the candidate had to touch down at the respective airfield, obtain a signature, and a uh, signature of someone in authority at that field, and then complete the next leg of that mission. Uh, this training method was rather expensive due to the consumption of equipment. Because not everybody who thought they could be a pilot could actually be a pilot. Now, once he graduated from flight school, after learning to fly the French way, he was sent to, um, oh, well, to, to fly the, for, you know, my apologies, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, he was assigned to Lafayette Escadrille which was designated N124, Again, the N indicates that this was a, uh, a squadron that flew Newports. And to uh, codify his uh, status as a military aviator, he was issued a pilot's identification card. And uh, here's David again with the uh, French pilot's uniform, all the uniforms that the uh, pilots, the volunteers at the Lafayette Escadrille wore, wore French uniforms. Um, actually, there was some concern too about the fact that the Americans, that these gentlemen were American uh, citizens. The issue was presented to the ambassador, America, uh, the United States ambassador in France, and it was kicked all the way up to Washington and the feeling was that even though these, and even though uh, Woodrow Wilson had proclaimed neutrality and uh, they were in some type of violation because they had gone to France to fight for France from a uh, neutral nation, uh, the feeling was that since they did not uh, swear allegiance to France and were only fighting for France, that they weren't going to forfeit their American citizenship. So they retained their American citizenship and that put another issue to rest. Uh, to uh, codify what I was saying before about David's name, if, it is, if it's spelled the way it's commonly issued in uh, any of the publications or on the internet, if it's listed as M-C-K-E-L-V-E-Y, you can see that they're saying that David didn't even know how to spell his own name correctly. So here he has it spelled K-E-L-V-Y. Uh, this is a copy of his uh, initial French Foreign Legion card before he went to flight training. This was the aviator's pilot's uh, identification card. And this is his logbook. 
and I'll show you various pages of that as we progress through this discussion. This is a picture of uh, a classic picture of the Lafayette Escadrille. And as you look at this, you wonder, what are those two critters? Um, these guys were rather unique and uh, uh, rambunctious, would say. They were a bunch of young men uh, in their 20s at, at, at the youngest, and uh, the oldest was only in his 30s. Uh, but uh, this is a picture of David. And if you Google Lafayette Escadrille, you'll see type this, this type of photograph reproduced several different ways. David is looking off to the side over at uh, Whiskey. And uh, some of the photographs just show him looking toward the cameraman and so forth. But the same, same photograph appears in multiple, uh, multiple displays and multiple publications. Uh, but this critter is a male lion cub. It was one of the mascots of the Lafayette Escadrille. Now, uh, this little critter is a female lion cub. This is whiskey, and this is soda. So you can get an idea of what these guys were thinking about. Um, the captain of the Lafayette Escadrille was uh, William Thaw II, a gentleman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, also uh, someone noteworthy, like David. Uh, he was one of the premier pilots of N-124. He was a flight commander, and he is the individual who managed to purchase the male lion cub whiskey at, uh, for 500 francs. And um, the other pilot, another premier pilot with the Lafayette Escadrille was Gervais Raoul Lofberry, more commonly known as Raoul Lofberry. And here he is in one of David's photographs of uh, Raoul Lofberry playing with the, with the tiger cubs, lion cubs, I'm sorry. Um, this, the big one is whiskey and the little one is, is soda. And um, they remained with the Lafayette Escadrille through the unit's duration. However, they were eventually given to the Paris Zoo. And several years after the war, uh, William Thaw went back to the zoo. And when the uh, lions saw him, they just rolled over on their back, expecting him to come over and play and paint and, and pet them. So they were rather docile critters. Uh, I, I personally would be hard pressed to be totally comfortable around them, but uh, it doesn't seem that uh, Lookberry was particularly concerned. Uh, they tended the male lion cub and uh, he was, as I said, one of the premier members, and he got 17 confirmed uh, victories. He was the uh, leading ace of the Lafayette Escadrille. He died on the 19th of May in 1918. Um, he was uh, an adjunct or an adjutant to uh, Huffer, who was the commander of the uh, American uh, unit, the 94th Air, uh, Air Squadron once the United States entered the war. However, this, this photograph is of Lofberry in his French uniform. Uh, and uh, he died in May because uh, he, he became exasperated. One of the pilots apparently uh, failed to shoot down an enemy plane that was closing in on their field. So he jumped into a plane, fired it up, took off, and attempted to uh, shoot the enemy, the German plane, down. Unfortunately, for some reason, he, he was killed. He was shot down, uh, plane caught fire, and whether or not he deliberately jumped or if he had forgotten in his haste to fasten his safety belt or his seat belt, uh, he may have fallen from the plane because he was a firm believer that if there were fires on the plane, by doing a side slip or various types of maneuvers, the pilot could, in fact, uh, put, extinguish the fire. Uh, he was also a very close associate of uh, Peterson's. At the time of uh, Lufbery's death, they were writing Lufbery's uh, biography, and uh, Peter, he was dictating it. Lufbery was di dictating his life story, and Peterson was writing it down. Unfortunately, all copies of that have been lost. So. 
there's nothing in David's hand that indicates that uh, he had any uh, st uh, stored material on Lothbury's life. Now, once David joined and was assigned to N124, now we're going back to the time when he was with the French. In September of 1917, he scored his first victory. And in the uh, opinion of uh, Norman Hall, uh, it's noted that he, of all the pilots, that David Peterson was the one who was least excited about his aerial adventures. Uh, uh, James Norman Hall wrote that uh, after a combat or after a patrol, the pilots would come back and the ones that uh, had scored a victory would be all jubilant and they'd be reiterating their uh, tales. Uh, some people would be telling about the big one that got away and others would be cursing a jammed machine gun that uh, didn't allow them to uh, participate very actively in the combat. And Peterson as a patrol leader would go to the headquarters and write in the logbook, nothing to report. And uh, Hall was always surprised that after some of these vicious combats, why he thought that that was just nothing to report when everybody else was so, so pumped. Um, Peterson had the reputation of being extremely calm. Uh, he led more patrols than any other pilot in the Lafayette Escadrille. And uh, he also could exhibit an almost inordinate or uncanny ability to see everything that was in the sky. He would be flying along and he'd be in his pad and uh, would have blue pennants on the on his wings, on the struts of the wings, and uh, they would follow him. And uh, the pilots in his patrol may not see anything in, unusual. He would waggle his wings and tear off at full speed, and they did nothing else but, but follow him, and they were sure to end up in some type of combat. Um, he had the un uncanny ability to see virtually everything that was in the sky. It was, uh, it was kind of unusual for uh, a pilot at that time, according to uh, his contemporaries. Um, in his long book, this is a couple pages from the book that I displayed earlier. When he had a combat, he would, he would load, uh, write it down. And here's an interesting uh, digression from military standards. It's flying a SPAD. Now, as I indicated earlier, if the escadrille or the squadron were flying Newports, it would be an N squadron, like N-124. Here he is in N-124, but he's flying a SPAD. And according to the French military terminology, it should have been SPA-124 but it shows to go you that uh, not all military thinking and uh, not all militaries uh, follow the strictest rules of uh, notation. And uh, that was one of the uh, things I found somewhat interesting with this. Um, here he was flying a SPAD and this was his first, this wasn't his first combat. He had other combats, three combats on another patrol back in the beginning of September and uh, when he had a confirmed victory, now they would call it a kill. In the First World War, whenever a pilot shot down an enemy plane, it was considered a victory. And the French had a very unique way of scoring victories. It had to be observed and confirmed by a ground observer other than the enemy, obviously. But the, if, if an enemy were captured, and the enemy, the German, uh, indicated that, oh yes, such and such plane was shot down in such and such sector at such and such time, and that corroborated the uh, report from a pilot, then the pilot would be given credit for that kill. Now, um, Peterson had a tendency to fly uh, the most patrols. He also flew Lone Wolf, and in many cases he flew behind enemy lines, well behind enemy lines, well behind any area, where a forward observer would be able to see any of his combats. So um, 
as I'll tell later, he had approximately 17 unconfirmed victories. And uh, that uh, really would have boosted his score to 23, but, uh, or yeah, 20, well, 22. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, because of the French way of uh, noting, he wouldn't get credit for it. The British aviation system was a little bit different. If a pilot came back and said, oh, he shot down a plane, almost taking the word for the pilot, they would give him credit for it. Now, uh, I'll digress a moment. The uh, term ace, we all know that an ace now is someone who shoots down five enemy planes or scores five uh, kills, five victories. But in the First World War, that was the first time that uh, the term was used and a reporter in France referred to a, um, I believe it was a boxer, as an ace. And uh, because he was uh, uh, an extremely proficient individual, so they called him an ace. Well, it happened that a French pilot scored five victories and um, when it was reported on the paper, the author of the article referred to him as an ace, being, you know, this guy's really good. And then the term stuck. So five victories, five kills equal an ace. Uh, when Peterson received confirmation of any of his victories in his logbook, he would uh, put a, uh, a box along the side of the uh, flight log, in the flight log. It would indicate, uh, obviously, the type of plane he was flying, a SPAD, and it was flying protection. Usually, uh, a protection flight would be to assist or to provide uh, cover for a reconnaissance aircraft. The reconnaissance aircrafts were usually two-seaters, and the reconnaissance aircraft, because they were two-seaters, had uh, the backseat uh, observer making notes of enemy, enemy positions, uh, serving as a tail gunner, also uh, perhaps being a cameraman, taking photographs of enemy dispositions, so that uh, those planes were uh, of vital importance because they didn't have radar in those days. They didn't have radio, very limited radio communication, if they had it at all in any of the planes. It was very, very limited. And um, the only way to obtain suitable information on a moving basis would be to actually fly over the enemy's locations and take photographs or to take notes. And uh, the more static method was to have uh, a wicker basket suspended behind beneath a, a large gas balloon. The large gas balloon would then be extended on a uh, cable to about 5,000 feet and the observer in the cave in the uh, basket below the gas filled uh, balloon would use binoculars or cameras to uh, try to spy on the enemy. Uh, the unfortunate thing was these were static and they were very good targets or par targets of opportunity. I wouldn't say they were very good targets because uh, the recollection of pilots who fought against the German observer balloons found out that they were very heavily protected, obviously, because they were uh, an intelligence asset and a lot of anti-aircraft artillery was placed around those in support of their protection. So be that as it may, uh, the uh, protection that Peterson was flying was either for a bomber group or for a, uh, a reconnaissance mission. And uh, the day before he had two combats of which he may have shot down the two planes, but he didn't get credit for it. The day that he did, one Bosch Albatross. Now, th there's another consideration that we'll talk about. Uh, these planes had a lot of similarities. They, they, they look alike uh, in, in, in many respects. So that, for example, if we're to say uh, uh, one's looking at a, uh, a, a Lexus sedan or a Lexus uh, uh, SUV. Uh, would it be the NX or the GS? Uh, same thing if you were looking at a Subaru Crosstrek. Is it the uh, LTD Crosstrek or is it the uh, PRE Crosstrek? The same thing with these planes. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that in the next uh, couple slides. 
uh, by the way, this is a commendation that he received because of his first victory. And it was signed by Captain Thaw. Thaw's autograph, autograph is there. It's, everything was written in French. These fellows who were part of the French military aviation uh, were commanded and were commanded by, uh, were led by French officers. Uh, that's standard. That is still the way it is in the French Foreign Legion. Um, anyone who wants to be a legionnaire or fight for France or join the French military has to be able to speak French. So uh, everything that Thaw wrote here is all in French. And what he's basically saying is that uh, Peterson encountered the enemy albatross at a given altitude, gave fight, there's machine gun jam. Peterson, by successful maneuvering, was able to clear the jam and to bring the plane down successfully and fire, you know, uh, to score the victory. And he got the commendation for it. Uh, now, in the uh, logbook, he indicated they was flying a SPAD. Now, there's a SPAD-7, and SPAD-7s were flown by the Lafayette Escadrille in 124. And this Sioux Indian chief with a full headdress is their standard marker. That is their insignia. So if you were to peruse any type of World War I aero history texts or photographs, and you saw an airplane that had a head of a Sioux chief with a full headdress, you would know that that was part of the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, this is an N, uh, uh, a SPAD-7, or it should have been an SPA-7 of uh, a particular unit, but they were being flown by the Lafayette Escadrille. The um, headdress is the insignia, but uh, this is a SPAD-7, and here's a SPAD-13. So you can see that they're basically similar planes. So it goes back to what I was saying about the uh, uh, commonality or the subtle differences between these device, these uh, ships, as they would call them, these kites or these planes. The uh, pilots would see this plane and it would be called a SPAD. And they would see this one would be a SPAD. It was a fine nuance for someone to say, oh, well, that was a SPAD-7, and this was a SPAD-13. I mean, they, they might know it, and they might not if they were to see it in the air. They would know it as a SPAD, but they would just recognize it for the style, same way that uh, now uh, cars have a distinctive appearance. You know, you see the, the L in the front of the Lexus. You don't know if it's, uh, you know, uh, what particular model it might be. So anyway, uh, this is a photograph or a drawing of the Albatross D3. And the Albatross D3 was the common Albatross fighter that the Germans used. And this is uh, a picture of the type of plane that uh, David had shot down. David wasn't always that lucky. He, he himself was shot down at one point in time. His plane was shot up. And this is another relic that he had. And this is a, a, a pump for pressurizing the fuel tank and uh, intake or the fuel tank on a uh, Hispano Souza engine. And that was a common engine on the SPADs or on the, uh, well, basically the SPADs. Um, you can see the uh, fact that this would fit over the gas tank and uh, could be used to pressurize the gas so that it would flow into the engine. Here's a spring. This is the part where the pilot would push. And uh, you can see the bullets that actually ripped through the uh, device. And this is the other, other side of the, of the device. And uh, Fortunately, his uh, plane did not catch fire. As a matter of fact, one of the letters that he wrote to his father, he said, uh, tell mother, and this was Eleanor, not, uh, not his mother, uh, Louise, not, not his mother who was de departed or deceased, but his stepmother, said, tell mother that pilots chew tobacco to plug the holes in the gas tanks. Mm, that alone would have probably brought shivers to the back of his mother's neck.
why would there be bullet holes in a gas tank? And uh, I don't know, this sound is, would sound pretty dangerous and would create a fair amount of worry, I would suspect. I know how I would feel personally as a father. Um, in 1918, the United States entered the war and David had concerns about being repatriated to the United States Air Service because of the fact that uh, the rumor was that the physicals were rather uh, stringent and that uh, the Air Service was somewhat disorganized. It was the first time that the United States actually had an, any development of an Air Service. Uh, the United States Army had used uh, planes before the war. Uh, I believe they had a grand total of two, perhaps three. Uh, maybe uh, they had experimented with the right pushers. And then they also had uh, uh, the Curtis Jenny plane, which was a uh, plane that was developed by uh, Glenn Curtis. Uh, they had a couple of those, but uh, other than that, there was no real uh, coordinated air service. The air service, the pilots were all assigned to the Signal Corps. Uh, the Signal Corps was originally designed uh, as a cavalry, as a, a horsebound unit, and uh, not, not necessarily cavalry, but uh, for reconnoitering, uh, best movement at that point in time in the late 19th century was to uh, travel by horse. So, uh, and to uh, set up uh, communication networks and so forth. So everything was uh, uh, horse propelled, everything had horsepower with the truest sense of horsepower. And uh, so the, there was some concern that the uh, air service was a little bit disorganized. And uh, if anyone is interested, there's a, a very good book written by Franston, Bert Franston, and it's called the uh, I don't know if this will show up very well. Goes hat in the ring, and it's available through the Chester County Library, and it's a very good authoritative uh, outline of the old boy network in the air service as it was being formed, uh, rivalries, the fact that uh, when the French trained Lafayette pilots were incorporated into the air service, they had. Uh, more liberal ideas in regard to discipline and order as opposed to the commanders, the typical army officers who were in command of the air service at that point in time. So there was a little bit of a, an insider dislike or concern about the uh, members who were coming in. So that was another concern that David had. Um, Atkinson, who was the head of the uh, first pursuit group, to which the pilots would be assigned, which was one of uh, the 103rd Aero Squadron, uh, met with uh, Lufberry. And Lufberry was a combat pilot, free thinker, rather uh, liberal in his ideas, and uh, not very much inclined to uh, push a pen or fly a desk. So uh, Atkinson was not, not particularly impressed, but uh, he did assign him as a uh, in a support role to Huffer, who is the uh, commander of uh, one of the units that we'll talk about. Uh, David was finally repatriated, and that, uh, that didn't take too long. He got through the uh, rigmarole rather quickly. And the uh, standard procedure was if the pilot were of average capabilities, he would be given the rank of lieutenant, first lieutenant. If he had exceptional abilities and was able to uh, command a flight, he would be made a flight commander and he would be given the rank of captain. And if he were able or had military discipline and was able to command a squadron, he would be given command of a full squadron at the rank of major. So initially when Captain Peterson was reassigned to the United States Air Service, he was given the rank of captain and he was put in the 103rd Aero Squadron along with other former Lafayette pilots. It was rather non, uh, 
<sighs> well, the 103rd had the experienced pilots, and they were relatively active, but uh, there were that was the place to to be if one wanted to uh, score any uh, any victories at that point. Um, and it was commanded by Thaw. And uh, David uh, was in that unit, but what had happened is that uh, another conniving uh, commander of the 94th needed some good pilots. And uh, here we have another famous name that pops up, Eddie Rickenbacker. Now, Eddie Rickenbacker was in the 94th Squadron. The 94th Squadron really wasn't doing a whole heck of a lot at that point in time. So he was seriously thinking of joining and getting a transfer to the 103rd, where all the action was. Meanwhile, the commander of the 103rd opted to uh, swap three of his green pilots, or, or swap three of his, the, the 103rd, the commander of the 103rd wanted to swap three of his convenience pilots with uh, for three green pilots and uh, the uh, the pilots that were uh, assigned were uh, Seth Lowe, Hobie Baker and uh, Edgar Tobin. They were transferred to the 103rd and Peterson and Hall and um, Marr, Kenneth Marr were transferred to the 94th, at which point Eddie Rickenbacker decided that, uh, and if you read his memoir, Fighting the Flying Circus, you can see, you can read that he was excited, the troop at uh, the 94th was excited because of the veteran pilots who were going to be joining them. So uh, it boosted his morale and then it kept him in the 94th. And uh, when David was transferred to the 94th, he was, uh, transferred as a uh, flight commander. And uh, as a flight commander, he played a role in one of the first aerial victories for the United States Air Service. And I'll go into some detail on that. It was in April, April 13th, that flight orders were posted at headquarters of the aerodrome that there was to be an all-American, meaning the United States Air Service All-American operation was to be initiated at 0600 hours on the 14th of April, the following day. And um, Eddie Rickenbacker relays in his uh, memoir that uh, he felt like a kid before Christmas. He, he couldn't sleep. He finally fell asleep. And uh, he said he was in the middle of a dream that he was shooting down a German plane when his orderly woke him and uh, told him it was time to get ready for his first patrol. He was so excited that uh, it took him a while to, to fall asleep that night. Um, Peterson obviously has no, no problems, no concerns. Uh, his letters home indicate that the one annoyance that he had is whenever the Germans would come over to bomb, that it would disturb their sleep. Um, he also referenced the fact that they could watch the artillery barrages in the distance, and it was like watching thunderstorms and uh, watching the flashes on, off the clouds and all. Strange, um, you know, strange observations, strange recollections. So on that uh, initial flight, David Peterson, Captain Peterson, was to be the flight commander, and he was to take two green pilots, and the green pilots were Reed Chambers and Eddie Rickenbacker, to accompany him. And you know, we know the fame of Eddie Rickenbacker at this point, and uh, to kind of think of him as being a, a green pilot is uh, you know, somewhat uh, shocking, but uh, we all had to start somewhere. So uh, he and Chambers were to accompany Peterson. Peterson gave them orders that if he turned back from the flight, they were to turn back from the flight. They were to return to the airfield, to the aerodrome. And uh, interesting things with both uh, Reed Chambers and Eddie Rick Rickenbacker. Eddie Rickenbacker was older. He was in his 30s when he uh, was a uh, fighter pilot in the First World War. He was a famous uh, driver, race car driver at that point. But uh, the fact is that uh, he wasn't a college man, and neither was Reed Chambers. Now, if we look at any of the... Uh, 
volunteers, you find that, that a lot of the volunteers in the Lafayette Escadrille were college men, uh, Ivy Leaguers, uh, aside from the fact that Peterson you know, was a civil engineer, uh, college graduate. Uh, some of the uh, other pilots were graduates or students from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and uh, you know, had various strong backgrounds in academia, but uh, or came from well-to-do or professional families, like Peterson's father was a physician and all. So that uh, Reed Chambers, was a uh, Midwestern, almost a farm boy. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker was uh, a race car driver. And uh, some, sometimes some of the people took umbrance with uh, the language that he used. He was a little bit rough around the edges, according to some observers. But anyway, uh, Peterson kind of took them under their wings. Uh, along with this, his wing, but uh, in regard to uh, this, they were to be the flight that would take off at 0600. And uh, Alan Winslow, Douglas Campbell, and Jimmy Meisner were to serve as the alert squadron in support of Peterson and Chambers should, uh, should they need support or should uh, the Germans attempt to attack or uh, forward observers observe uh, enemy planes coming in their direction. So they were to fly off and to go in support of Peterson and uh, his flight. And uh, Peterson's flight was just to fly along the front, uh, the Sammy Hill area, uh, about a 25 mile front up and back and to scout out and to destroy any enemy planes that they would encounter. Uh, well, once they took off, unfortunately, it was uh, rainy, foggy, poorly, uh, and very poor weather. Uh, Peterson decided to abort the mission. However, uh, Chambers and Rickenbacker uh, didn't follow orders. They they continued on, and uh, got, they got separated from each other. They succeeded in getting lost, and uh, Chambers made it back to the aerodrome the following day. Uh, <laughs> they he managed to land somewhere and be refueled and get taken care of. But uh, he did he did come back. They, they didn't run into any enemy planes, and Eddie Rickenbacker uh, did find his way back to the field, even though there were low hanging clouds and he wasn't familiar with the territory because he had just been transferred to that aerodrome. So he had no uh, conception of what the landmarks were. There were no GPS systems in those days. There's the compass and dead reckoning. And um, he finally got back to the field. When he landed at the field, Peterson uh, proceeded to really ream him out tell him that he was a darn fool for taking off in that weather and, and continuing to fly. He was supposed to have come back to the field. And uh, in the meantime, while they're having their heart-to-heart, uh, -heart, um, the alert pilots get a call from a forward observer indicating that uh, there were two enemy planes proceeding in their general uh, direction. So uh, Winslow, Campbell, and Meisner get into their planes and attempt to take off. Uh, Meisner's plane had mechanical difficulties and couldn't take off. So Alan uh, Winslow, he took off and he, he was first to take off and he was attacked and uh, came up underneath a, a, the, uh, a German plane and almost collided with the plane, but uh, they were heading toward each other. He uh, did some violent maneuvering and uh, succeeded in shooting down the enemy plane. Meanwhile, uh, Campbell is going to assist Winslow and he is attacked by another, by the second German plane. So uh, Winslow had already scored the victory. So at this point, he's attempting to come to the aid of Campbell, whereupon Campbell doesn't need help. He shoots down the plane himself. And uh, they score a propaganda victory, first off, because this is the first, these are the first aerial victories for the United States Air Service, the United States with the United States pilots. So it's the uh, first air victory, and it's so close to the beginning, and it's the beginning of their uh, actual combat experiences that. Uh, the huge propaganda boost, uh, and uh, it's a, they make hay out of that. Uh, they really uh, exploit the uh, 
the fact that the the pilots you know were successful in shooting down not just one enemy plane in their first military operation but two planes uh, unfortunately luck doesn't hold out and uh, you know things do ultimately change over time but uh, it was it was a good coup for them uh, this is a picture of Campbell beside his Newport. It was a Newport 28. Uh, that's an interesting plane. This is what the uh, plane looked like. The fuselage is round and uh, as opposed to the uh, more boxy and uh, bus-like appearance of the spads that I showed before or the shark-like appearance of the German planes, the, the Albatross. But uh, anyway, this is a Newport 28. It's an interesting plane. Uh, the United States didn't have any planes of its own. They had to buy planes from France and the French manufactured this Newport 28. And uh, it really wasn't a top of the line plane. The uh, spans were considerably better. Uh, even the earlier Newports were probably better than this. It had a, a tendency to uh, shed its wing fabric. These planes were basically a wood structure, a wooden structure covered with doped canvas. All of this would be canvas wrapped around the wooden wood, the wood structure. There would be some metal involved, but uh, most of it was wood. You can see the uh, struts here, they're wood. And uh, the, uh, the plane itself had a tendency to shed the fabric on the upper wing. And uh, it did create some consternation, I mean, uh, at one time, in a violent uh, turn, violent maneuver, Eddie Rickenbacker, his plane started to shred and shed its its covering. Uh, a couple other pilots had the same, and I believe there were even some fatalities as a result of that. This is the type of plane that was shot down by uh, Campbell. There was even though it was considered the, one of the first American victories, it was actually the, the second plane that was shot down in that encounter. Um, it's a false uh, D3. And uh, I will back up a bit and see what the false looks like. And we'll compare that to the appearance of the albatross. You can see there's uh, quite a bit of similarity that uh, shark-like appearance and uh, even the pilot sometimes had difficulties because in, in Peterson's log, he wrote, he noted that uh, our pilots brought down two albatross near our field, quote unquote. So that even he looked at this plane and uh, thought it was an albatross. So uh, you, can, you can see those slight uh, nuances of interpretation as far as the plane. This is what was left of the plane that, uh, that Campbell had shot down. Um, some reports are that it went down in flames. Uh, some of this could be smoldering wreckage from the engine. Uh, some of it could be just poor, pho uh, poor photographic quality. Because if this plane had actually burned, these struts would have been totally destroyed. It would have been nothing more than a pile of ash. Now, and this is another picture of Campbell insert. Um, you can see that the uh, wings are essentially totally denuded. And why? Because the pilots took trophies. And this is the insignia off the side of that plane or off of that plane that was shot down. It was uh, one of the first planes that was, it is from the first plane that was shot down. It was from the one that Campbell had shot down. Uh, Peterson had put a note on the back of it that it was a plane that was shot down by Campbell on such and such date in April, la di da. So that uh, that is the trophy. And this is the reverse, this is the back side of it. And these are bullet holes. Uh, this is the reverse side. And you can see that uh, even though there are no obvious bullet holes here, they are here. Uh, because the planes were wood structures covered with doped canvas, that's uh, doped canvas would be the best analogy, uh, a piece of cloth covered with uh, varnish or uh, some type of super glue, not, not, not the uh, cyanoacrylate super glue, but uh, 
some of the smelly toluene solvent type glues uh, to be covered with that type of uh, doping. And uh, when the planes came back, you know, they obviously weren't discarded because of the fact that they had a few bullet holes. The uh, mechanics and the ground crew would then repair the damage and uh, it'd be good to go again. So that is the uh, role that Peterson played with the, in the first, first victory. And that was a, uh, a trophy that he was given. And uh, the provenance for that is that if you were to read Eddie Rickenbacker's uh, memoir, he would say that uh, they essentially uh, denuded the planes, took the trophies, and uh, what ultimately occurred was a General Order 17 was then given because everybody plundered the planes that were shot down at that point. And General Order 17 was that no victories, no shot down enemy aircraft were to be um, tampered with, they would be placed under guard until then Army intelligence or other inspectors could look at the plane, obviously looking for uh, anything that would be of uh, interest, whether it's a, a new type of uh, mechanism for the operation of the, of the plane or whatever, so that the, the, the plane could be used as a source of intelligence gathering before before it was totally looted. Now, after his stint with the uh, 94th, and because of his skill as a pilot, he was given command of the 94th Aero Squadron, and as such, he was promoted to Major. Major, as I indicated before, was a rank that would be afforded to any pilot who, or, uh, who showed the ability to lead a squadron, and because of his uh, previous experiences, he was given command of the 95th Aero Squadron. While he was there, he received uh, three, had three victories while with the 94th, which he received credit for. And at the 95th, he had two, two victories, and that officially made him an ace, although we already had one confirmed victory and at least 17 unconfirmed victories while flying with the, uh, with the French. So um, he had, uh, you know, somewhere around uh, 23 total total victories. Um, another fellow who was one of the pilots that uh, Peterson uh, was familiar with and, and friends with was Lieutenant Sumner Sewell. He was in the 95th Aero Squadron and uh, he became an ace. He was actually uh, uh, a balloon buster. He had shot down or uh, scored uh, victories on the uh, Germans by shooting down observation balloons or at least one observation balloon. And uh, he did achieve seven total victories and perhaps others while he was uh, not given credit for it. Uh, his vir first victory occurred on the 3rd of June, 1918. Uh, an interesting aside, Sumner Sewell was the 58th governor of Maine and uh, he was flying a SPAD, and this is an insignia from the SPAD that he shot down. I'm not the SPAD, I'm sorry, not the SPAD that he shot down, but the Rumpler. It was a Rumpler uh, that he had shot down, and uh, this was uh, probably off the uh, surface of the wing because it's a very large piece of material. Dope material is about uh, 36 to 40 inches long with about uh, 12 to 24 inches wide. So it's a, it's a pretty big, pretty big chunk of doped uh, fabric. Uh, this is possibly Sumner Sewell, but it's, uh, I, I've included that as a photograph to show you uh, what the insignia of the uh, 95th Aero Squadron was. And that was the uh, kicking mule. We'll go back to 94th and the 94th symbol is still in use today and that is the hat in the ring insignia and you would see that on modern fighters that uh, still uh, would have that same insignia the same thing with the uh, I'm quite certain the same thing with the kicking mule insignia that would also be uh, uh, visible today on the units 
uh, for example, uh, you know, sort of very protective and uh, of their insignias, especially if they've had any type of wartime history attached to them. And uh, that's one of the uh, things of camaraderie and uh, unification within the military, within the units. But anyway, this is a, a spad and uh, uh, let's see. This is the insignia in the, the plane that the initial plane that he shot down was a uh, uh, a German Rumpler observation plane was brought down and uh, that was his first victory. Uh, is everybody with me? Is any any did I lose anyone? Uh, Kathy, am I still? There, there are maybe two or three people that have retired. Oh, from okay. The program. Oh, okay. I was afraid that I had lost somebody. I was uh, going along with my monologue, and uh, I didn't see much activity. I was afraid that my uh, uh, the things had dropped off. That the, <laughs> my internet had dropped off. No, your your internet is fine. Oh, okay. Good. Thanks. So uh, this is the insignia from uh, the first plane that uh, Sumner Sewell shot down. And it was a, uh, a rumpler. And a rumpler was a biplace, rumpler biplace brought down by Lieutenant Sewell. And uh, it was an observation plane, a reconnaissance plane. Uh, it's a bi biplace, meaning that there were two seats. The forward seat was the pilot, and then the rear seat was the observer who would be taking, uh, making notes of uh, important uh, military installations of the enemy and it will also serve as a tail gunner. So the, these planes were given a little bit more protection, even though they were generally slower and um, you know, sometimes more considered more vulnerable, but uh, they were still valuable targets. So it didn't demean a pilot if he shot down a slow, a slow moving reconnaissance plane because of the fact that they were dangerous and taking information or gathering information that they shouldn't have. Um, Peterson was uh, removed from command in uh, September of 19, and he was uh, given uh, uh, a ticket home. Uh, he was the officer in charge, made officer in charge of gunnery at Colstrom Field in Arcadia, Florida. Uh, the interesting thing, too, with the pilots of the early days, I didn't mention this uh, before, but uh, there were certain occupational hazards. So obviously, you can see that these planes had open cockpits. The uh, maximum altitude was anywhere from 17,000 to 20,000 feet. Uh, hypoxia, a shortage of oxygen, or the oxygen, deplet oxygen depletion would be a concern. And also, uh, cold, the temperature was extremely low, especially if they were flying in the wintertime, it would even be uh, sub zero. Uh, and another occupational hazard was uh, diarrhea from inhaling the fumes that were ex uh, ex exhausted from the engine. Uh, many of the engines uh, had a component that required uh, castor oil. And uh, the pilots, as they were flying along, were inhaling and uh, ingesting fair amounts of castor oil. Aside from the fact that these were open cockpits and they were having wind burn and uh, um, other uh, uh, frostbite uh, conditions. So anyway, uh, Peterson was returned, uh, came back to the United States in October, uh, and he was given the position of officer in charge of gunnery at Colson Field in Arcadia, Florida, near Fort Myers, Florida. And they would frequently make cross-country flights. And uh, while he was there, he would uh, fly over to Daytona Beach and they'd be a lady friend. And uh, part of the uh, cross-country flights that was interesting is the fact that they would actually land their military aircraft on the beach and park their plane on the beach while they spent the weekend at the hotel and uh, the pilots would spend the weekend at the, uh, at the resorts. And then after the end of the weekend, uh, fly back, get in their plane, take off from the beach, and uh, perhaps uh, do some uh, aer uh, uh, 
aerobatic type uh, maneuvers uh, to thrill the crowds that had gathered on the beach because another concern at that point in time that we have to think about is that the airplanes were rather unique. They weren't uh, as common as they are today. So anytime someone saw a an airplane, that definitely piqued someone's curiosity. So especially to see a, an airplane parked on the beach uh, and to know that the pilots might be, sh you know, showing off or doing some type of uh, uh, maneuvering once they took off would be uh, quite a thrill in those days. And um, the unfortunate thing is that after one of these escapades, he was killed in a crash. Uh, there were two other planes aside from his, but because he was the ranking officer, he was the major, and he was, uh, by deference, given the uh, right to take off first. The, the beach was crowded by, with spectators who um, had come to see also a, a, a car race on the beach, but uh, the beach was crowded and he uh, had some difficulty maneuvering the plane off the beach because of the, the people, the bystanders, but uh, it did manage to get to an altitude of about 100 feet, 150 feet. The engine died and crashed. And uh, these are the two ladies that the pilot and the observer, uh, Francis Xavier Pavisic, met with the uh, one lady. This is, uh, her name was Helen Vago. And this is uh, Esther Edwards Kukin, who was a divorcee who uh, then went by the name of Esther Edwards, and she was a uh, wannabe actress, and she was attending drama school in uh, Chicago, uh, Morgan's Dramatic Studio or something like that in, in Chicago. And uh, these were the uh, ladies that the, both the uh, gentlemen would meet. And this was a photograph taken by Major Pete, the uh, common... Uh, Nickname for David at that time among his friends was Pete because of Peterson. So they called him Major Pete. And uh, the observer of the other fellow in the plane when it crashed was uh, Paversick. And he was nicknamed Pat. So Major Pete called Francis Paversick Pat. So they were in the plane when it crashed. The plane that crashed was a, uh, a Lusak, a, pa a Packard Lusak. And um, this is this is a photograph that was taken before the crash, the same day. And this is a photograph of what was left of the plane. Obviously, it's been uh, partly uh, re part of it's been removed. The uh, only part that's left here is the fuselage from the observer's position on back. The pilots, Nasil, and uh, the wings have all been been removed. So this is. Uh, a post several day uh, photograph of the actual remains of the plane. Uh, Peterson was killed in the crash. This was a cop what the plane looked like. Uh, he was killed in the crash and Lieutenant uh, Pavisek survived. Now, the body was shipped back to Honesdale, Pennsylvania. And then it was picked up in the, uh, the, the train went to New York, and then it was put on an Erie Railroad train that went to Honesdale, and the train stopped in uh, Port Jervis, New York, and there it was met by uh, Henry Sweet Jones and uh, Dr. Peterson, David's father, and they accompanied the body to uh, uh, Honesdale, and uh, Charles Dolan was also, uh, uh, he accompanied the body from Florida. Uh, when the funeral was held, it was at the Presbyterian Church in Honesdale, and the members of the pallbearers were John Haberton, uh, McClanahan, Mitchell, uh, but Dolan, Sweet, and Sewell were all fighter pilots. Uh, Dolan and Jones were Lafayette men who had served with Peterson and who still served with him. Sewell was the individual who uh, served with him at the ninety in the ninety fifth, and these were the uh, pallbearers for his funeral. This is a photograph of the cortege, the hearse, and the pallbearers marching along. The cortege consisted of uh, that uh, hearse, the pallbearers marching along, 
followed by two automobiles. Again, automobiles at that point in time were rather rare. Um, and the first automobile was uh, the family, and then the next automobile had dignitaries from the town and uh, and the military. And then there were marchers from the National Guard and uh, even a contingent of Civil War veterans marched in the uh, funeral procession. They went to the Dibury, uh, Glen Dibury Cemetery, and this is a photograph of the proceedings at the, uh, at the cemetery. And you can see the eight, eight pallbearers here. And when the uh, final uh, rifle salute was given, the story is that a, an owl had flown from its perch and glided across the gravesite and went over into the other part of the cemetery as a kind of a natural fitting tribute tribute to David. Um, he received two distinguished service crosses and the service cross, the distinguished service cross is the second highest award that a combat uh, soldier or combat uh, veteran can receive not to be confused with the uh, Distinguished Service Medal. The uh, cross is just below the Medal of Honor. And Peterson received two of those for meritorious activities. And he was also given the Croix de Guerre from uh, France with four palms because of his service to France and his uh, exploits there. Uh, these are the victories that he encountered, that it, he was given credit for. And when he died, the newspapers across the country reported the major's death, death and heroism during the war. Um, his history has been recorded in, in several books, uh, but only as a, more or less as a footnote. Um, obviously, uh, his history is noted by James Norman Hall, Arch White House, uh, Harold Hartney, who was the head, who was actually one of his commanders Hartney was a commander of the first pursuit group of which the 94th and 95th were uh, participating squadrons. Uh, he was mentioned in Eddie Rickenbacker's uh, memoirs, uh, Burt Franzen, etc. There are numerous, numerous books that uh, refer to uh, Peterson. Um, he was also memorialized in 1934 in a trading gum, a chewing gum trading card. It was with the Chickles chewing gum, which is the predecessor of the Chicklets. And the American Legion post in Honesdale was named in his honor. Also, uh, the uh, one consideration with these pilots is the fact that there were like uh, there were heroes in the sense that there weren't a lot of them. Like the early astronauts, we we know the names of the early astronauts: John Glenn, uh, Shepard, uh, Grissom, and. Uh, after that, we kind of lose sight because they're, they become more common. And these guys were the, the first. These were the groundbreakers. These were the guys who risked it all and uh, came back essentially alive or had tales to tell and stories that were you know, sometimes blown out of proportion or totally fictionalized, but uh, were still a rare group. Um, now, as you'd be hard pressed to name a, a a flyer who was an ace, even though they do exist or they did exist during the Gulf War or uh, Second World War, Korea, and so forth, but they became more common. So that's one of the uh, reasons that the early flyers were given such, uh, such notoriety. So that concludes my presentation. If there's any question, uh, definitely feel free. I don't see a chat session, so I'm, I'm not sure if there are any chat questions. But uh, if there are any other questions, definitely uh, feel free now to ask. And also, if when you look at the outline and have questions regarding that, feel free to contact me at the library. Just drop a note in the uh, uh, return book section that you'd like uh, me to contact you. And I'll, I promise I will get back in touch with you and try to give you the information you want. And, uh, do it in less than uh, 500 words. Are there any, any questions, any concerns?
Yeah, I wanted to ask a question about Eddie Reckenbacher. Yes, um, I'm, I'm not an expert on Reckenbacher, but I can try to uh, give you some information. Go ahead, sir. Well, I was told that he had some enormous amount of victories. And uh, oh, yes, he was an ace, absolutely. And he, but I mean, many, many times over. And, uh, and didn't he found uh, an airline? Was it uh, uh, Eastern? I believe he was. Yeah, uh, Eastern Rail. Yeah, an right. Executive with Eastern. Yeah. A lot of these former uh, World War One pilots did go into the uh, air transportation business. Uh, Sumner Sewell was a uh, president of. Uh, from transatlantic uh, ocean going uh, 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 aeronautic company. But uh, yes, to, to go back to Eddie Rickenbacker, yes, he was the high scoring ace of the First World War, I think 23 victories or more. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the reason I mentioned it is because his, his start was somewhat uh, inglorious in the fact that he didn't follow Peterson's orders, but uh, yeah. it was the first combat. Uh, patrol that he was engaged in. And uh, obviously, I would say the rest of it is history. If you read anything about Eddie Rickenbacker, you will find that, again, he was the uh, was essential ace of the First World War on the United States side. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, mm -hmm. sir? Yeah, I have uh, one other. What you used to see is these combat pilots like that with the white scarf around their, around their face. Uh, their yeah. face and famous yeah. for, for drinking brandy. And my understanding of those two is that this was tried to keep the fumes from being inhaled and uh, the brandy off, offset the uh, castor oil that was used in the- mm -hmm. uh, uh, Correct. Uh, and uh, I can, I'll expand a little bit on both of those topics. Uh, that scarf too was to keep their neck from being chafed. Uh, Modern fighter pilots now have all types of electronic uh, gadgets that let them know when an enemy is near, when a missile is being fired at them, when they're on radar, uh, uh -huh. and so forth. Uh, these guys were in an open cockpit flying at altitudes where there might have been some oxygen deprivation, and they had to keep continually scanning. So by turning their necks back and forth against the... Uh, rigid uniforms that they were wearing. Oh, okay. They had the, the scarf. So the silk scarf, aside from looking flamboyant and, and serving also as a mask, protected their <clears throat> delicate necks from being chafed, to chafed that's, raw. That's, that's terrific. Thank you. And uh, the other thing with the, with the brandy, um, part of the concern with Peterson being removed from uh, command of the 95th had to do with the drinking and the uh, laxical command uh, performance uh, mm -hmm. presumed by by some people that not not strictly confirmed um, drinking these these guys first off are young men not that right. that would justify inebriation but uh, Harold Hartney the uh, commander said that you know he didn't mind if people drank if they drank though and it impeded their 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 service then that would be an issue and there was no indication that Peterson had any any drinking problem that would uh, impede his uh, his judgment or his ability. Obviously, he was a very fine pilot. That's why he was uh, promoted and essentially made a top gun at uh, Carlson Field. But uh, if aside from the fact that you had mentioned the uh, uh, amelioration of the uh, of the fumes, the gastrointestinal issues, uh, the fact that uh, Pilots had a very high mortality rate. We're talking about the ones who lived and survived. Uh, some some estimates say that some of these pilots didn't last more than six weeks before they were killed. Uh -huh. the, the, the numbers, the sheer numbers who were destroyed and shot down, both the French, the British, the Germans, uh, the sheer numbers are, are mind-boggling, but we don't hear about those because of the fact that they don't don't remember their names. They don't remember what they did, and uh, you know they they lost. And uh, it was the guys who uh, walked away from the uh, from the battles who we now know mostly what happened, and they're the, they're the ones who were raised in the positions of, of heroes. Although obviously one of the heroes on the German side was uh, Rickhoven, uh, Baron von Rickhoven. But uh, aside from that, you know they were. 
there was a very high mortality rate. And if they knew they weren't going to last very long uh, to ameliorate that concern, they uh, did, did have a, a fair amount of imbibing. As a matter of fact, the 95th was noted for having its own bar, its own white-coated bartender, and one of the best supplied liquor cabinets in all of the uh, fields of operation. So you can see that uh, <laughs> Peterson, as a commander, would have been well appreciated by his uh, subordinates, but maybe uh, the superiors would have a different look. Was there, was there any uh, relationship to offsetting the, the brandy, offsetting any of the fumes from the engine, or is that just uh, hogwash? Um, <sighs> would I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not heard anything differently. But so. No, it would, uh, it would ease the stomach distress, but it wouldn't make it go away. But what it would do is uh, perhaps in some cases uh, imbue the pilot with uh, additional courage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, In vino is veritas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yes, and uh, Walter. Walter, there was a there was a chat question a moment ago about uh, where he, he is buried. Um, his funeral was in Honesdale. Is he buried in a cemetery in Honesdale? Uh, yes. uh, to answer that question, yes, he is buried at the Glen Dyberry Cemetery in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. Um, I believe if someone goes to a website called Find a Grave, <coughs> they may be able to actually see the location specifically, but it's in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. Uh, at this point, it's uh, not, a, not a remarkable uh, tourist attraction, we'll say, but uh, that's, that's where he's buried. Thank you. Any other questions? Super job, Walter. I appreciate it very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there are so many things that, uh, you know, we want to throw out there and uh, I can't give you all the answers because if I ever publish the book, nobody's going to want to buy the book if you already know what it's all about. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I have, a, I have an alternative motive here, but uh, it's, it's really interesting if you read some of his letters. Uh, actually, if you have a moment, I can uh, go through my file here. His, his uh, half-brother, Denton, was a youngster when he was in the service, when, when David was in the service. So uh, he had sent, David had sent a postcard to his younger brother. This is the, the postcard, very charming. You can see this cut out. Um, he mailed, David mailed this from France and mm -hmm. uh, Denton was a stamp collector. So he, he just cut the stamp off, off the back <laughs> and uh, put it in his collection. And uh, this is David's letter to him. And uh, I'll take the liberty of reading it. It was on July 25th, 1917. And he starts off, principal sports now are flying and surf bathing. The beach is the best imaginable and the jellyfishes are gradually going away. Can't beat the army, David McKay Peterson. <laughs> so he, there, there were there were good moments. Obviously, uh, they had uh, as I as showed earlier in the French sector with the N124, the, the lion cubs. Um, there's a movie called Flyboys. Uh, if anybody wants to watch it, it's not historically accurate, but it was the original, wasn't it? Pardon. That won a, a, an award, didn't win the, didn't they win the best uh, best picture award? Fly, fly, fly boys, was it? Um, that I don't know. It's it's not historically accurate, and no, uh, I remember it, seeing it. He, he the movie alludes to uh, kind of a cursory view of the Lafayette Escadrille and yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, romanticizing some of this, but it it gives you a good overview and explanation of some of the things that the pilots did, and. Uh, some of the aerial shots, even though they might be computer generated, are kind of fascinating because it gives you an idea of what these guys encountered when they were actually flying and fighting. And, uh, you know, the fact that these planes were, by our modern standards, somewhat flimsy. The wings would 
could come off, the wings could collapse. Uh, oh, yeah. Obviously, the uh, Newport 28 that the French didn't want, they sold to the Americans, and the Americans, some pilots loved it. Uh, Eddie Rickenbacker uh, scored uh, victories with the, with the 28. Uh, Peterson uh, uh, used the SPAD most of the time, but uh, you know, the, the different types of planes had different uh, vulnerabilities. Some of the uh, flying characteristics were unique because some of the planes had uh, a rotary engine so that the pistons would actually rotate yes. as opposed to an inline V8 or a V12 engine. So uh, there would be that uh, counter motion as this uh, propeller is spinning the engine couple hundred pounds of uh, steel or metal spinning around is uh, providing some type of torque that's pulling the plane, wants to pull it in one direction. So the pilot has to compensate by shifting to another direction. And uh, it's uh, Rudder. very costly sometimes in pilot life. Yeah. Walter? Yes. It is, it is after 8.30. We probably should call it an evening if anybody doesn't have any further questions for now. I am. Um, we've, we've been getting chats in just people thanking you very much for a wonderful presentation. Very informative. I have one quick I question. question. And if anybody has any questions, again, once you've looked at the outline and you want to fill in some blanks or want, want me to go over something or clarify some point, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me and I will be more than glad to personally get back to you. And thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, Walter. Thank you. Good night, stay everyone. Safe and, stay safe and sane. <laughs> yes, Good night. right. And healthy. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Kathy. Good job. Appreciate it. Okay, you're very welcome. <laughs>